Right. Um, so I'm Henry Strada. I work for a company called Outplay. We've done a petition for the agency working in the development field. Uh, lots of web apps, of Django, related things. Uh, and yeah, I sort of like to review my craft. I've watched some videos. I've talked by a woman called Sandy Metz, who is a uh, leader world, who's fantastic. And there's one talk called The Rules, and I thought I'd try following them. Of, or head in that direction at least with some things and see what I learned and see if I like them. So, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, so, yeah, this talk is we'll lay out what the rules are. Um, I'll show some bits of code that I've been practicing to get them nearer to following the rules and like not following them. Uh, I'll mention on the way some techniques and guidelines that work well with those rules and sort of then my reflections on following the rules. So, the rules. First rule is that no class can have more than 100 lines. No method can have more than five lines. No method can have more than four parameters. You're not allowed to pass in a ditch. <laughs> so these rules kind of feel pretty tight when you first hear them. I was like, wow, that's kind of mental, it feels like it's sort of some straight jacket that you want to break free. But there is, there is a sort of meta level rule that for the life of reality that if you're pairing, you can persuade your pair that the you're justified in breaking the rule this time, then you're allowed to do that. Um, all these slides are on GitHub and the URL the slides at the end if anyone's part the text. So you are worried about providing the details. So, um, as an example, um, so there's, a, there's this online tool we use to play our work, and it's often just down to the half day level. And you might have kind of like the people's name on one side, and then the, the dates they're working on different things um, on the bars. And one thing we wanted to do for management, for like working out how much money we're going to be bringing in. Um, over a month of work, was to sort of count the days for different clients, what was billable, what was um, something else, so like new knowledge for billable and really something else happening, to make sure that everyone was doing enough work and spot were not early. Um, so, this tool has a um, JSON export, I don't bother trying to read it, but there's lots of details, there's some line text, there's a mini map over that side. You see, it's quite long, it's quite nasty. Uh, big JSON export, lots of fun. Um, one particular sample of some stuff I'm interested in, so I have like a sort of collection of rows the person's made, and then you'll have this, and there'll be a start mode to finish mode, which is an interesting name for it, but okay. so that gives you the date and time for doing that, and then the label tells you what the project is, the type, you go and look at the table that that's orange, and that's going to work. So, that's the kind of data we're passing. Um, and this is just like a block of time, so just to start doing <coughs> numbers for it, what I do is I want to translate it into like basically a series of half day, like a sort of, I think in a dictionary, there's like a half day and there's a string as a key, and then the value of the data that I want to do in that half day, and I can just iterate through that of half days and get to what's done, and count them up. So that was what I was trying to do there. Um, so, again, don't try to read this, but this is just to show you the broad shape of a single class of code that I've written to do this. This isn't even all of it. So I thought I'd try and abstract some of this, is, some of this out, following the rules. Um, and also, sometimes it's sort of funny enough to, like, to do a sprint test on code, where you probably can't read this anyway, but you step back and sprint a bit and just look at the syntax highlighted colours, you kind of get a feel for it of, like, there's not that much pattern in there, things are a little bit mixed up. It's not, maybe not terrible, but um, there'll be a contrast later to how it looks after I've done some stuff. So here's some detail of the code. I'm using a lot of dictionaries to store um, to store the uh, information, um, rather than like having a separate class at this point. So I've got these like three different types. <coughs> I'm interested in like knowing all the keys internally and 
Um, I have to say, everything tightly explicitly. Um, so, that's basically a proof of the object of your design. Uh, so, I defined a space class activity as a base class. Uh, the extra init thing I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, the Unicode method is because I wanted to like sort of have, sometimes I was going through a lot of keys to like count on stuff. I thought it was standard keys, so that might be something that you're doing more than one place, but it's a standard place to have it. And I can have different, I can override it in child classes if I want to. Um, so the, the empty activity is called by the child and set itself up. Um, I've got here in simple, yeah, there was an example in the previous screenshot, it went out too much. So that's, um, by like small classes. Top one has a quite hit five line method thing. It could probably have done some. Yeah, done a turn of the estate thing, but anyway. Um, and then once something was in the back of the main class that was using these, I can then create a period activity class and just pass in what I need to. The civil activity was one less thing I have to pass in because it's being dealt with inside the class. So, Started by improving this a bit. Um, and so now we have sort of the class zoomed out a bit. You've got the, act the activity classes that sort of reasonably spread out with a repeated pattern there, which to me is generally a good thing. And then the bigger class is still sort of quite by the needs, but yeah, we did a spin test against yeah, so that before. Oops. So before and after, to me there's a sort of clear, better pattern going on. Um, but part of this, um, just to get a slide on, <coughs> um, if you just kind of come, come across it, you can be like, oh yes, I'm falling in love with it, I'm going to use it everywhere, it's a lovely thing, and so if you want to sort of, you can go a bit mad and like create stuff with like, really big hierarchies, but I would strongly advocate trying to keep your inheritance hierarchies as shallow and narrow. So not too many layers deep and not massively wide because that's just a sort of rule of thumb I found which sort of helps keep things under control. Um, and something that can be do that is to use composition instead of inheritance. It's not that you should never use inheritance, but um, when you're thinking about that, often you can use composition. Because the composition, for those who don't know, is um, you basically contain as an object within yours, you pass the messages on through. So rather than just inheriting what's wrapped that would be a method there, you might have a wrapper which passes the method on. Which is a little bit of duplication, it feels like more work initially, but it gives you a lot more flexibility and keeps you better decoupled and um, it's more likely you can reuse the objects. I haven't got detailed examples, but I just wanted to like, throw that out there and say, when you're going for inheritance, just to ask yourself the question, could I use composition instead? Would that make more sense? Um, so, here's an example of a deep hierarchy, which I'm going to update views. So, update views got nine ancestor <coughs> classes, mine including the base object class. Um, and I did find a diagram of the entire kind of class based views hierarchy or on one image and I won't subject you to that. Um, as an aside, there was a vanilla views project. And, yeah. Do you have a question? Is it a really good website resource, CCBB? Yeah, but I sort of, the fact that you need a website to yeah. you your class hierarchy to have a chance of understanding it Perhaps. is, to me, indicative that maybe there's an issue. I mean, yeah, it's really useful. Given this hierarchy, it's very useful, but if you had a shallow hierarchy, well, you might not need the website because um, good. if you look up Django Vanilla Views, you'll probably find a blog post by Tom Christie who wrote it, who's a bit of an argument between him and one of the core developers of the comments underneath it, but it's got some interesting points in there and you can use Django Vanilla Views instead of the built in Django Views if you want. They're fairly similar in their endpoint. Um, so, um, so another aspect of 
um, what I've tried to do with these objects is this is open closed principle, which is the O in the solid. You can cross solid as a little acronym about objects which are inside. I'm not going to go anywhere near going through the whole lot. The open closed one I quite like. The idea is you're making your code open for extension but closed for modification. So with my activity classes, I could add another activity class quite easily and I wouldn't have to modify the existing classes to do it. And the sort of, if something's the ideal you do is you never have to edit the old code, which means you never introduce a plug into your old working code. Because if you don't edit it, you folks can't get into it. But you can still extend your code in new and interesting ways. Um, so, you're probably not going to hit that amazingly well a lot of the time, but to sort of, again, to try and think, think about the way of doing it. Um, have small, simple classes and be user. Um, so what I'd like to talk about, you know, one, thing, one thing that makes it easier to extend, you know, this is extra nip thing I've used before. So, super, which wasn't in that case, when, you, when you're using super in Python, you have to like, say what class you're actually in, and often you like creating a new class and you copy and paste, and then you forget that somewhere in there there's a super statement and you've got the wrong class name in there, and it's gone wrong. So who's, who's had that error? Well, they sort of copied the, super, the wrong class name into the uh, super and then had a bug that's all a bit weird and then just work it out. Simplified and Python 3 for the common keys. Sorry? Simplified and Python 3 for the common keys. It's still oh, uh, yeah, I'm wrong. I don't use that. So, that's a pretty common error where you've got the wrong pair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's wrong? No. So here's a pattern. Um, so instead of that, you've got this extra init method that I'm just going to date this code, I'm not going to have it, but I did have an extra init method which is called from it within the init. And the definition it was in the activity class is empty, so it's just a class <coughs> statement. Um, I'll update the slide on the internet, so if you go and copy it from there, you'll find it there. And then we override it, because there's nothing in the, in the extra init method in activity, you can override it without having to call super. Um, it allows for a cleaner way of extending your methods. Um, this doesn't work so well with multiple levels of hierarchy because you have to like have an extra in it at the first level and then the second level you have to have an extra extra in it. <coughs> but for sort of one level hierarchy, it's it's nice and it sort of just means you don't have to worry about because often you forget to put super in there to start with as well. Um, so this is a nice little pattern I came across. Um, so that's where I'll move on to another chunk of code. Um, so at one point I was, I was saying that I'm using these sort of half days as like wanting to be able to integrate through the half days to add things up. So this was an early version, and that's more on the second slide, of a uh, function. And the idea is it's just a generator, um, or just produces strings like this in turn. You pass in a start date time and an end date time, and it could start. Like, it could be like starting at here, so that might as well be there. It would start at here and just go through all the half days that are in a block on that diagram we saw a while ago. Um, so we set up um, AM PM is just kind of like when you're <coughs> just a string AM or PM. And then we have some like dates, to use date plus date time. Um, and just to point out here that this is just returning, if you give it a day in AMP and you get one of these strings in that format. And then here's the rest of the method. This is sort of a fairly complicated generator in that there are five yield, different yield statements in here. We've first got the first case where we're like saying, for the first day you've passed in, I mean, I'm, 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 that's another point, we're only doing the weekdays, we're not doing, if it's a weekend day, I just want to skip past it. So, yeah, we sort of, on the first day, if it's a PM day, it's a special case, and if it's a weekday, then we want to like, give you this first half day with a PM, and then we increment the day. 
Let me go, go through doing AM, PM. <coughs> and then the, 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 the last day, there's more special cases as well. So it's, it's kind of complex. Um, and if you wanted to extend it and sort of sometimes do weekends and sometimes not, this is where <coughs> this is not open. Like extending this without causing bugs in the original thing would get quite complicated. So I had a go at refactoring it. And so I created two classes. One was just a half day class. I haven't done everything inside it. So we've got, we've sort of encapsulated, we've got increments, which just um, increments through the next half day. So if it's a morning day, then it increments to the afternoon day. If it's an afternoon day, it goes forward one day and then sets itself to the morning. Um, I also added then an increment weekday, which skips the weekends. Uh, we've got the less than operator. So we do, I, I recommended some more in the actual class, but in the end, <coughs> the code we do skip that. Um, and finally, we've also got a Unicode method, which probably most of you can't see it, it's right on the floor. Um, and that Unicode method is the returns that string in the format I showed you earlier. Um, and then, in this half day iterator, and up here, there's a bit of complexity with setting up. The actual iterator itself, I sort of get the half day and the end half day. It's just while half day is less than end half day here, <coughs> and then increment. That's a much simpler loop to do. If I wanted to do one that didn't do include weekends, I could just use half day dot increment instead of half day dot increment weekday, which is again you might be up to the next down the bottom of the screen. So this code to me feels much more sort of open for extension. And the half day class. I could, could well be able to reuse in some other way, but I'll come across some method of doing that later on. I think on this talk. So there's a couple of little wisdom on this thing. So this was a, we to it some way, it's kind of like, what does that mean? It's kind of like thinking about refactoring. Um, so to, to, to say, when you've got a new feature coming up, you first think about, okay, I've got my code here, but still the new feature, ideally my code will be structured in a way that this new feature will be easy. So you spend some time refactoring, not adding new functionality, in such a way that you make the change easy. And getting to the point where, make, where the change will be easy might be hard. It might be some work to do that. But then once you've done that, then you can make the easy change to add your new feature. But you're sort of doing refactoring, ideally there's a whole set of tests around it. So you can like keep your test passing beam the whole way through the refactor. We have that in new, added any new functionality, and then once you've got it to the point where the change will be easy, then you make the easy change to implement the new function. Um, Frame stay melting at this point. So. Uh, yeah, so what I've learned from sort of trying these things out is I have found bits of code that come out and then get more reusable. I, found, I have found these to extend things, so I'm certainly going to be going on trying to use these rules. Uh, and yeah, so the other thing that to, to play you is the first of video, she's also written this book, Practical Objects for Into Design and Booming. This is a very fine book that sort of explains all of this much better than I'm just explaining to you, I'm sure. Uh, and it explains sort of plenty more stuff. <coughs> the object always designed these in favour. Uh, so that's the book. Sandynets.com is her website which has got links to her talks, videos online, where again she's good at explaining stuff. The link at the top is the source for this talk, uh, along with the notes. Been reading that, but I'll take them going. Um, and we started to get us back on the uh, schedule time, so thank you. We've got about two minutes for a question or two if anyone's. Yeah, thank you.
I'm not the suggested meta rule. I used to set myself the task of writing something as few lines as possible, and it results in the most horribly unreadable code ever. And I think that your rules as they stand encourage that behaviour when what you're actually going towards is current. So I I don't know how you'd encapsulate it. Um, I think there should be something in there that just says don't use these rules, basically. I mean, yeah, I mean, the rules are to some extent arbitrary, and it's a kind of training exercise, and yeah, the aim is good, clean, the yeah. usable code. So it doesn't preclude following that aim. Yeah, yeah, it's not an idea to try and squeeze lots and lots of things on one line, so certainly that's not the aim. Um, <laughs> it's been quite brilliant to have you here, and I think it's really interesting to see what no one's like giving you a performance rate of paper for following these rules, so, yeah. Right, on the evidence spectrum, have you experimented with using something like a GitHub to enforce these rules, so when you do submit something, you don't end up submitting anything too large, and that inadvertently breaks rules, or if not, and if you can analyze how often you broke the rules to find any areas of complexity? <coughs> I mean, I, I certainly don't think they should be applied with that rule with a kind of GitHub, unless maybe you're doing like a, a dojo, Sort of where you're doing a particular exercise and then you just utterly strictly stick to them. There is a get out clause that is meant to be used when things just sort of don't work. But it's sort of, yeah, doing exercises or you've got some code you can play. No, no, there's only one if you had tried that out. No, 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 I haven't done that. I haven't sort of got far enough to the project. <laughs> like, I've done it everywhere. Just, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.